So I'm a huge Jeep guy. We have anybody in the room that like, you're a Jeeper? Come on, we got some Jeepers in the room. Amazing. So I have bought, built, flipped a lot of Jeeps. And uh, I've always had a Jeep. Uh, I'm a Jeep guy. I like trucks and stuff like that. But Jeeps are consistent. Uh, I love uh, whenever I'm looking for a Jeep, I'm pretty comfortable with knowing uh, the product. I'm comfortable because they're consistent. Now, if you have no clue about Jeeps, you're like, I don't know about Jeeps. We're just, just, I'll be over it in just a minute. This is just for my Jeep family in the room. But I'm comfortable, so I, I make pretty quick decisions when purchasing and building and modifying Jeeps because, again, I know the product. I was putting this together, and a friend of mine was telling me a story about a guy in New York who uh, was a Jeep enthusiast like me. He was all about the Jeep life. And so he took the top off the Jeep, took the doors off, because that's what you do. There's so many things that you can do with the Jeep. And uh, he ran out of leather conditioner, and he was like, I gotta shine it up. So he put armor all on everything. And it made the seats real slick. And so he came around the corner to come into his driveway a little too quick. And because he didn't have his doors on and his top was down, he came around the corner and slid right off the seat into his front yard. And his Jeep just kind of rolled into the garage door. Y'all, how many vehicles can you brag that you can slick up the seat and be thrown out of the... I think it's pretty impressive. I do. I love Jeeps. I love people that love Jeeps. They're consistent across all models. The JK, the JL, I like Rubicons. I've had the Jeep truck, which if you're a big truck enthusiast, you're like, that's not a real truck. You should see the ones I've modded. They're pretty sweet. But you can do beach drives and off-road and mudding. Uh, mudding, I promise you, we're going to dive into the Word. Just give me a second. This is just my moment. Because if I wasn't, listen, if I wasn't a pastor, I'd have Diamond Dan's Jeep sales. Like... I would, it's just true. And then if you're part of this, y'all know when you were driving, where's all the Jeep people again? We got the, we got the handshake, we got like the special wave. If you don't know anything about it, then you're not a part of the cult, the club. What did I say? <laughs> the club? You know. Why are we talking about this? I know the product. I'm comfortable because it's consistent. I've got history, years and years of history with the Jeep life. So let's shift gears for a minute, no pun intended. Spiritually, let's shift gears for a minute. While God is far beyond our understanding in so many ways, he's always faithful, and he allows himself to be known in a constant and consistent way. Earlier in my prayer, when we were transitioning the service, uh, the reason why I can be confident and we can be confident and you can be confident in seasons of brokenness or despair or chaos in the economy is because he and I have got history. So when the enemy tries to come and tries to get in your head and say, yeah, but this is the situation, this is the, 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 the economy, this is the situation that's going to ruin and mess up and, and everything's going to fall apart, you can say, well, it's interesting because if God did it before and he showed up and fought for me before and delivered me from the fire or in the fire before, then he's going to show up again. Why? Because he and I have history. So me and Jeeps have history. Me and God have history. I'm comfortable with my sonship with the Lord Almighty. Because when other people have lied, ran out on me, and even betrayed us, whoo, God has always been there. Come on. How many of y'all have history with the Lord? Like you would say, I've got, he and I have history. So today we're going to read through the Bible. We're a Bible, full Bible reading. We believe it is the unfailing word of the living God. We're going to read in the Bible about some great faith, a great decision, and what it looks like to choose courage over comfort, because God is and always will be consistent. So before we dive into the text this weekend, I want to look at some biblical background. We're going to look at three characters today, a man named Abraham, his wife Sarah, and their son Isaac. So the Lord appears to Abraham and he asks him this question and then this prophetic moment begins to be revealed. It's in Genesis chapter 18, verses nine through 15. It's on the screens. Where's your wife Sarah? There in the tent, he said. This is Abraham saying she's in the tent. Then the Lord said, I will surely return this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent 
which was behind him. Verse 11 says, Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So to give you some biblical context, Abraham would have been around 100 years old at this time. So the Spirit of God shows up and says, hey, I'm going to give you a son. Around this time next year, you're going to have a baby. He's like, okay. Have you talked to Sarah? Because <laughs> Sarah would have been around 90. Some of y'all are like, that is not the Lord for me. Amen. <laughs> well advanced in childbearing years. Verse 12 says, so Sarah, because she overheard it. Y'all, if you're not reading the Bible, there's adventure. There's chaos. There's mystery. There's love moments. There's comedy. <laughs> like, some of y'all are like, I do. I watch The Chosen. Okay, I get it. But you got to get in the word. Watch this. So verse 12 says, so Sarah laughed to herself and thought, after I'm worn out, my master, Abraham, he's old. Will I have this pleasure? Verse 13, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? The, verse 14, this is where it begins to shift. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Ask yourself that question. That rent that's due situation that feels like you're up against the wall and you can't get through, that marriage that looks like it may be falling apart, that son or daughter who's gotten caught up in the prodigal life, that addiction that's tried to creep back in, is anything too hard for the Lord? This is the question that he asks in this moment. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Verse 15, Sarah was afraid. The Lord had heard that she had been <laughs> listening in. And she lied and said, I did not laugh. And the Lord said, yes, you did laugh. I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> so just as the Lord had said, later on, the appointed time, Sarah had a baby. And they named him Isaac. So let's fast forward the life of Isaac, he's growing up, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's growing up, 10 years old, 11. Abraham and Sarah have their son. Bible theologians believe that the story we're about to read, he was around 12 years of age. Now, I want to set this moment up for maybe some of you who are new to the faith. If you're new to the faith, this story that we're about to read through can be a little disturbing. It's one of great faith and great obedience. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, if you've been raised in church, if you're a seasoned saint, you're like, I know the story he's going to. But one key takeaway before we dive into this text, before we read this today, I want you to know this. God, throughout biblical history, has never been a proponent of human sacrifice. He actually despises it. Throughout history, though, we'll see that God does use different means of testing our faith and he was looking for a heart of obedience and trust from Abraham that ultimately ended up being a test. How many of y'all have ever been tested by the Lord? You're like, yeah, my marriage, <laughs> my five-year-old, <laughs> amen. <laughs> no, but we walk through these tests. We walk through these moments. God was testing him, and I'll prove it. Genesis 22, verses 1. It opens up in verse 1 by saying, sometime later, God tested Abraham. It's right there. God said to Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He replied, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will show you. Wow, it's heavy. Verse three, early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey, took with him his two servants and his son. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Verse four, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Verse five, he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then come back to you. Now, what I love about this, because Abraham and God have history, you can see little glimpses of the prophetic all throughout this text where he said, hey, y'all stay here. Me and my boy are gonna go over there and worship and then we will come back. He was already preparing that God, you've asked me to do this, and I'm going to be obedient, but I know that you're providing a better way. I'm going to say yes, even though I don't have all of the details. You've given me some direction, and I'm going to trust you even when I can't track you. But all throughout, you see glimpses of, 
It's going to be okay. He and I have history. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac. He himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two went up together. Verse 7, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went up together. Again, he was declaring in a prophetic stance because he knew, I can trust my God. I'm going to do as he's asking. I'm going to follow through and obey. I'm not going to choose comfortable. I'm going to choose courage and trust that God's going to show up. Verse 9, when they reached that place God had told him about, Abraham built the altar, arranged the wood, bound his son to the altar. Then he reached out his hand to take the knife to slay the son. In verse 11, this is where God shows up. And the prophetic moment that Abraham was believing for, heaven touched earth. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. You know he was like, here I am. <laughs> yes, yes, Lord. I was waiting on this moment. I feel like there's so many times that we miss because maybe we're not trusting with weighted expectation. Like how many of y'all are really expecting? I remember when Jackie and I were in the hospital and we were in the ER and you've heard me tell this story before. We were in there and all things in the natural were caving in around me but at the exact same time, I kept saying, may the Lord bless us and keep us, make his face to shine upon us, be gracious to us, turn your countenance towards us right now. And God, right now, in the midst of the chaos, you have the ability to overshadow this moment with peace. How many of y'all are expecting and looking for the Spirit of God in heavy moments? Isaiah 40, verse 31 in the Amplified says, those that wait, look for, and expect will gain new strength. He was waiting on God to provide, but he was still following through with obedience. Verse 11, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do nothing to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son, which is wild to me because this is in Genesis, but it's also a foreshadowing of what God did for us and humanity. He sent Jesus, his only son, to hang on the cross for us because he said you were valuable, that you were worth it. So it's almost this foreshadow of what is to come. He said, don't touch the boy. But then verse 13, it shifts. Abraham looked up and there was in the thicket, in the bush, he saw a ram caught by its horns. Now, what's wild about this entire story is where did the ram come from? Did it come up another side of the mountain? Was it trailing them the whole time? <laughs> like, I can imagine Abraham's like, come on, let's go. Lasso is the ram. No, no, no. God provided it in the nick of time, and he sees the ram in the thicket, and they use it as the sacrifice instead. So Abraham called that place, verse 14, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Watch how provision begins to unfold, though. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham again from heaven and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore of Galveston. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of your enemies and through your offspring. Watch this. This was a generational blessing. Through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. What an amazing story of faith. But if you're new to the Bible, you're like, whoa, that, that was a lot to get through. I'm going to break this text down, though, because there's so much to study in the life and the faith of Abraham and the way he processed, the way he reasoned, the way he prospered as a result of his walk with God. If you're taking down notes, which we always encourage you to, it's on the screen. You can take a picture of it. Number one, we have to, like Abraham, know the promise. We have to know the promise. And not only do you have to know the promise, you have to know the promise keeper. 
We back up in Genesis 18, which between Genesis 18 and Genesis 22, we discovered that God is speaking to Abraham and Sarah about them having a baby. Now, around 13 years later, when Isaac is 12, four chapters later, we see that God is still showing up and moving. He is still the promise keeper. So we have to know the promise. Abraham had previous encounters with God. How many of y'all have had previous encounters with God? And because of his previous encounters with God, he knew God's characteristics. He knew that his faithfulness had showed up before over and over and over again. They were evident. And as believers, we too need to know that God will show up. And as we study his word, life will begin to shift and change the narrative of our lives we'll start recognizing that his promises don't have expiration dates on them. When we know the promise of who God is, it creates a foundation that we can build not only our lives on, but a generational legacy upon. This is amazing when you actually study the text and you look at what happens when you actually follow the promise keeper. As believers, as we study the word and it gets into us, again, what fills spills. So when you're squeezed in life, you say, I know that this seems bleak. I know this this seems heavy. I know that inflation is real. I know that there's a threat of a layoff. I know that this is happening all around me. Well, why are you so peaceful? Because I know the promise. But why are you so steadfast? And why are you still so calm? Because I have history with the promise keeper. Abraham had history with the promise keeper. Number two, This is something else Abraham did that we can learn and live out. Number two, don't hesitate. Abraham didn't hesitate. Procrastination is delayed obedience. When God spoke it, he knew the promise keeper and he took that step of faith. We preach this all the time in Hope City that God will give you direction. I said it a moment ago without all the details. Come on, where's all the, you're like, God, he told me. And then he said, now you just pray and fast and just Stay in my presence, and I'll show you the way as it begins to unfold. In Genesis, we read that Abraham, we read that Abraham rose up early the next morning and did as the Lord asked. Hebrews 11, verse 17 through 19 also paints the same story because Abraham had faith when he was tested, gave his son as a gift. God made a promise to Abraham that he would give him a son. We read that in Genesis 18. Abraham was willing to give his only son. 18 says that God said to Abraham, your family will come from Isaac. He had the promise from the promise keeper. Verse 19, Abraham believed that God was able to bring Isaac back to life again if he had to follow through. So it may be said that Abraham did receive him back from death. God rescued, showed up, and provided a sacrifice. Abraham, again, understood the track record of God. Just close your eyes for just a moment. Every campus, I want you to look back. Just get a snapshot of your life, the moments he showed up and fought for you, the moments he rescued you, the moment he spoke to your heart and said, get out of that toxic relationship or that situation. That moment he showed up, even though it was in the 11th hour, you know he provided and protected and Abraham had history with God. He knew God's track record. Do you know God's track record? We talk about remembering all that God has done as an alignment check moment. Because the enemy will try to throw new obstacles at you. Take a moment and pause and close your eyes and say, but I know God's track record. And he is Exodus 14, 14 fighting for me. I just need to be still and trust him. Come on, if you receive that, say amen. The potential sacrifice of Isaac was an obstacle. It was unsettling. It was even disturbing, but hardly in comparison to the God that Abraham knew and served. I wonder, I wonder how many blessings we've blocked because we've hesitated. But you know the thing about God is he's the God that can resurrect it again. Maybe that situation, maybe you knew you should have gotten hope or help. We believe that counseling is a good thing. Maybe there's some things you've hesitated in. Maybe there was a business that God spoke or a dream he asked you to step out in faith in. God's not past resurrecting it. That dead dream can come alive again. 
that business that he spoke in 18 and 19 that you were excited about, and then 2020 happened, and you're like, well, I guess it's over. No, if God spoke it, his promises are yes and amen. He has the ability to resurrect it. That marriage that looks like it's falling apart, that family dynamic, God has the ability to breathe new life into it. So again, number one, we have to know the promise and know the promise keeper. Number two, we have to not hesitate. And number three, if you're taking down notes, we have to have faith for what follows. Because so many times we know the promise, maybe we even take the step and we don't hesitate, but then, ah, this is where we begin to waver. This is where we get a little weary. <laughs> We have to have faith. This is what happened with Abraham. He had faith for what followed. If the promise from God was supernatural, then the power had to be supernatural. The same is true for us. If the promise of God over our lives is supernatural, then the power has to be supernatural. And the reason I say if is because there are things we call blessings, even say God did it and God didn't. <laughs> I'm gonna step on some toes for just a minute. God didn't give you that promotion if you had to tear down someone else's character to get it. Oh, but God, God showed up and God did it. Mm -mm. There's no scripture that backs building a platform by tearing someone else's down. God didn't increase you financially if it was through dishonest gains. God didn't bring you your soulmate if that relationship was built on lust and not biblical love. So, so many times we say God did it, but when it's not God, you'll have to find a way in your own strength to sustain it. And I'm telling you, that's a very high maintenance way to live. That's why you have to know the promise. That's why you have to know the promise keeper. That's why you have to stay focused and have faith to follow through even when it gets hard. But when God does it, when God breathes on it, he'll sustain it, and there's no devil in hell that can come between what God has decreed over your life. Because if God showed up and he did it, provided it, even positioned you in a seat for it, Romans 8.31 says that if God is for you, who cares who's against you? Come on. How many of y'all received that today? If God is for you, it doesn't matter. Some of y'all are so concerned. You're like, Pastor Daniel, I want to stand up for what's right. I want to stand up for the truth, but I'm concerned about being canceled. Like they can cancel what God has started in you and what God has placed in you. But when we know the promise keeper, when we don't hesitate, when we have the faith to follow, we choose courage over comfort. Here in America, we love boxing. It's one of our favorite pastimes. And, you know, before MMA and all that stuff got popular, I watched real boxing, like Evander Holyfield versus Mike Tyson. Like, boxing now is a 22 year old YouTuber <laughs> who fights old champs from 1974, and they're like, Yeah, I won. I'm like, I don't even think that guy can swing anymore. Like, <laughs> but in boxing, there's two typically well matched. Contenders, in the ring of life, every day there's a match taking place in our hearts and our minds, and the matches between comfort and courage. If you're taking down notes, I want you to write this down. Comfort is costly, but courage is an investment. For Abraham, the cost of not obeying God was way too high. And because he had history with God, he knew this comfortable choice, uh, it's, it could cost me, and it would have cost him. He would have never become the father of many nations. I believe the unique revelation of that opportunity that he had to follow after God, he had to choose in that moment, comfort versus courage. Being comfortable will also have you going back and opening up doors that God had closed for you and your protection. That's what comfort does. It causes you to say, ah, this is getting a little bit hard. I'll go back to this relationship. He, he, he was... He, he was pretty good to me. Girl, he ran up your credit cards and messed with all of your credit score. Somebody, you're like, yeah, did you email him? How did he know that? Being comfortable will have you going back to doors that God closed for you and your protection. Comfort versus courage. Being comfortable and not moving when God says, moving into what he's asking you to step into with great faith will keep you out of rooms 
that you were supposed to be in. When you get too comfortable, you'll allow the enemy to rob you of your courage. That can ultimately change the trajectory of your life. I remember when Jackie and I first got married, we were walking out different steps and there was some times that we wanted to choose comfort because it would have been way easier. It would have been way easier just to have stayed put because when you step out with courageous faith, it puts a bullseye on your back because the enemy realizes, oh man, she's dangerous. All he recognized there's healing in his hands. All he recognizes he has a purpose and a call and an assignment on his life. So we had to make some decisions. Are we gonna choose comfort? Or are we gonna choose courage? Because being too comfortable not choosing the way of radical faith and courageous faith can literally change the entire trajectory of your life. Write this down. Comfort is temporary. But courage is eternal. Comfort is t- temporary, but courage is eternal. Comfort leaves you satisfied for a season, where courage leaves you fulfilled for a lifetime. Let me paint this parallel for a minute. Well, what if Abraham would have said, when the Spirit of God showed up and said, I want you to go to the mountain Moriah, I want you to take Isaac, and I want you to go and, and offer him as an offering, what if he'd have said, I'm good. <laughs> God, I'm okay. I've got my girl, Sarah. <laughs> like, she gets her nails done. Like She's good. I love Sarah. I got my boy, Isaac. Thank you for that. Like He's doing good. We just got him braces. Like, he's, he's, he's playing baseball. He's pretty, he's pretty good. What if he'd have gotten comfortable? We're like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, we wouldn't even be reading this story. But in Western Christianity, we do this all the time. We ask God, we go to the promise keeper, we ask, and he gives us the career we prayed for, the kids we begged for, the house we dreamt of. But then we use excuses like, man, I work too many hours to have to try to go to church every Sunday. Like, I got to go all, they want me to serve. There's other people that serve like missions, outreaches, like I'll give to it, but I'm never going to show up. Like I do too much. I deserve my weekends or we say things like, why would I take my kids to youth group? Don't you know Houston traffic at 6 PM? Maybe they can go once a month or maybe once a quarter. They're going to do that camp thing, which by the way, we're doing camp. And if you have junior high or high school students, make sure you sign up for camp. It's going to be next level. Come on. Where's all the parents out with junior high, high school age students? Nine of you. Praise God. (laughs) So anyway, so I got my career. I got my family. I got the business. My dreams are coming true. And now this church is going to put up a Hope City News and ask for us to tithe and give. Don't y'all get grants? Don't y'all do car washes and stuff to raise money to keep these doors open? Why do I need to give my hard-earned money? Do you think this mortgage is going to pay for itself? What happens is we ask for the blessing, and we walk away from the blesser. We ask for God to show up and breathe, and then when we actually get it, we say, oh, God, use somebody else. And God's saying, really? Really? Because the breath you breathe, the skills and the tools I've equipped you with, Ephesians 6, 7 says everything we do, we should do it as unto the Lord. Well, I'm stepping on a few toes. Some of you are like, he's coming in, coming in hot. Like being courageous though with your time, your talent, your treasure, your finances, your energy, your service unto the Lord, it builds a strong foundation and it builds a strong family. It builds a legacy. It'll leave a mark on your neighbor. It'll change a region in your city. It'll leave you feeling fulfilled. And then that righteousness is reproduced and then released through you, like Abraham's journey, for generations to come. One of my fathers in the faith, Dr. Scott Hagen, one of our overseers, Dr. Hagen said this to me about 15 years ago. So Brecken is 14. It'll be 15 New Year's Eve. But before we had Breck, Dr. Hagen asked me, he said, God is equipping you and has equipped you with so many amazing things for the kingdom. I said, thank you, sir. And he said, so what if you and Jackie run really hard? What if you guys build everything and you're super obedient? You follow through on everything God has asked. But then there's this lid. Like no matter how hard and how much you pray and how fast you run, you'll never get through that lid. There's a ceiling. 
This is how many people God can trust you with. This is the, the, the reach and the platform that he is going to make you be a good steward of. If there was a lid and you never could bust through that lid, would you still run as hard? I'm like, well, give me more to the story. Like, <laughs> and he said, the lid is actually the floor of the next generation. The lid for you is actually the floor that your kids and their kids will build upon. Now will you work as hard? I mean, I'm crying. <laughs> but I think about it all the time. Because I know the promise and the promise keeper. When God breathes and says, walk this out and then have the faith to follow, it's not just for us. It's not just for us. It's for the generations to come. It's to preach the good news of the gospel and reach as many people as we can because being comfortable, comfort leaves you conformed, but courage leaves you transformed. It's on the screen. Comfort leaves you conformed, but courage leaves you transformed. Leaves you transformed. Speaking of conformed, <laughs> have y'all noticed the posture nowadays? Chiropractors refer to it as the text neck. Because we've been conformed by the access that we have right here. TikTok, Instagram, learning new dance moves. How many likes did I get? You can't stare at this device for seven hours a day and not end up with the posture of a sink faucet. Like, just. And y'all, the real influencers online are chiropractors now. I watch reel after reel of people getting adjusted, just snap, crackle, pop. Jackie's like, what do you watch? I'm like, look at this. She's like, oof. Because her dad was a chiropractor, so this is what we do in our pastime. If you leave today and there's a Ferrari in the parking lot, it's probably a local chiropractor because they know. <laughs> We've conformed, this is a practical thing, to the technology and the access we have. Now, some of y'all are all over chat GPT. You're like, give me an essay on William Tell. Okay. Watch this, the same is true spiritually. You can't spend time in the word and spend time in the presence of God every day and not end up looking like Jesus. That's why he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. We go to Google WebMD and what it says online before we get into the word. This is a cheesy saying, but you'll remember it. Some of y'all need to get off Facebook and get your face in the book. That's so bad. I'm not gonna do that the next service. But you'll remember it. Again, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world because the pattern of this world is trying to tell our kids things that we would have never been okay with years ago. The pattern of this world is trying to tell our kids this is the real truth, but we know the truth because comfort will leave you conformed, but the word of God will transform your family from babies all the way up where things that... We used to say, no, this isn't okay because it doesn't look like the truth, and now we're turning a blind eye to. I said this weeks ago, we're getting comfortable around tables that Jesus would have wanted to flip over. Do not conform, but be transformed by the word of God. We have to. Comfort versus courage. Don't be molded and pressed into the shape that the world is trying to fit us in. Students, listen to me. Don't be shaped and molded by what the world tells you you have to be fit in. Shake off the noise. I tell our kids all the time, you're not affected by peer pressure. You are peer pressure. When you walk into a room, you lead the way. There's people that walk trails, and then there are people that chop down trees and blaze new paths. You be the peer pressure. Don't fit into the mold that everybody says is the authentic you and the new truth, but be transformed by the power of Jesus. Shining a light. He'll shine a light on your path show you a better way to be human. Abraham, if he would have refused courage and would have stayed comfortable and refused God's plan, it would have cost him his legacy. But because he was obedient, his temporary inconvenience turned out to be an investment that left him the father of many nations. He did what no one else was willing to do and he ultimately saw what no one else had ever seen. 
more descendants than the grain of sand, more descendants than the stars in the galaxy. So my question for all of us at all of our campuses watching online, are you choosing comfort or courage? Because if you wanna become stronger, listen, you're gonna have to get uncomfortable. If you wanna become stronger, it's gonna take courageous faith because I've read the end of the book and we win, but we will go through wars and rumors of wars. We, we will go through seasons of what is going on. But when you choose courageous faith and you say, I'm a child of the most high God and if God is for me, who cares who's against me? Me and him have history. Are you choosing comfort over courage? Because excuses make today easy, but tomorrow hard. Discipline makes today hard, but tomorrow easy. Will you choose courageous faith, the disciplined life of growing deeper? Not just, yeah, I'm a Christian, but no, I'm a son of the living God. I'm a daughter of the living God. I trust him even when I can't fully track him. I wanna encourage you, when you choose courage over comfort, you'll find yourself living a life of audacious faith that outweighs any wins and any accolades that you'll experience on this earth. Last scripture, and then we're gonna pray. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. I love that. That they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So by show of hands, how many of y'all are ready to choose courage over comfort? Come on. Amen. Can you stand to your feet? Just close your eyes. Would you lift your hands open-handedly like this just for a moment? God, today, this is my prayer because there are some in the room right now that are like, Daniel, I hear you. Wow. It's a great, faith-filled, passionate sermon, but... The truth is I have been choosing comfort over courage because I've just been trying to survive life. I've just been trying to get through the day with every eye closed just for a moment with your hands lifted towards heaven. God, I pray that you would meet them where they're at as they take a step today to let go of things that have made them comfortable, things they've gravitated back towards, doors you've closed that they've tried to pry back open. We allow you, God, to do some remodeling. <laughs> some rearranging, some adjusting, some realigning. We commit today to choose courage over being comfortable. We get our yes out of the way and we want to follow after you because we know you, the promise, the promise keeper, and we're not going to hesitate. We're going to step out in bold faith when you ask us. We're going to have the faith in the name of Jesus, the faith to follow. So God, my prayer today, for everyone who wants to step out of the comfort zone, because the truth is, the comfort zone is just that, it's comfortable, but nothing ever grows there. Nothing ever grows there. And we're gonna start, we wanna start living a life of great faith and great courage. Now right now, just you in God, a daughter to a father, a father to a son, would you just in that posture as a kid after the heart of God, will you just begin to talk to the Lord? If there's an area of your life that you need him to just pluck out, pull out, fix, restore, heal, would you just talk to him? You can whisper it. You don't have to say it loud. It doesn't have to be a spectacle. But just right now, just you and him. God, this area right here is why I'm not choosing courage. This area right here is why I felt like things were falling apart. But today I realize that they could fall into place when I choose great faith and courageous faith today. In Jesus' name. Come on, did you get something out of today's word? Give God praise today. We choose comfort. Nope. We choose courage over comfort. With every eye closed, just for a moment, one more time, this is the reason we do all of this at all of our locations. If you're watching online, our team will help you there. But if you're here today and you'd say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. That is the foundation of choosing courage over comfort. To know the promise keeper is everything to having the faith to follow. But maybe you're here, two invitations. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. This is the first time I want to give my life to him. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You would say, Daniel, I want to rededicate my life. 
I got caught up in the prodigal life and I got comfortable and I'm falling apart. I need to come back home to the arms of God. I want to choose courage over comfort today. I want to come back to the promise keeper. I'm going to count to three. And if you're either one of those invitations, the first one, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Or number two, you want to rededicate your life. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand and say, you're talking about me. One, at all of our locations, I want to give my life to Jesus. Two, if you're watching online, say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. Three, if you're in the room, lift up your hand. I'm looking. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. And you, 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 and you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Let's go. I saw you. Amazing. Come on, Home City. Let's make some noise. Give God praise. You can put your hands down. It was 13 or 14 that said, today's my day, just in this room. Not counting the other campuses or online, but this is what I want to do. I want everybody to pray this prayer with boldness today. Say, Jesus, it's me. From today on, I'm choosing great faith and courage over comfort. Thank you for hanging on that cross for my life. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it for me because you said I was worth it. You rose again on the third day to give me freedom and a life of abundance. From this moment on, I'm asking you to remove anything in my life that has been an obstacle, all my shame, all my sin, all my poor choices, I ask for your forgiveness. I'm choosing you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. Thank you for choosing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise?